Well, hello everyone and welcome uh, to our BVI conference. Thank you very much for joining us. Unfortunately, we can't be in the BVI this year, but we're delighted to have so many of you join us from BVI and London and further afield for the first of our 2020 webinars. We're going to start today with a discussion from Tom Lowe QC and Claire Stanley QC on future issues in insolvency litigation. You may be aware that the program said that this was going to be talked between Lexa Hilliard QC and Claire. Unfortunately, Lexa can't join us today, but Tom has very kindly uh, stepped in. There'll then be a panel discussion between Andrew Mould QC, Bobby Friedman and Tara Taylor on abusive process in cross-border cases. And we're going to end with uh, some virtual networking. You don't need to do anything for this apart from uh, stay on the Zoom call. It's all been arranged by our marketing team and breakout rooms will be organized for six people and we'll have a chat for about 10 minutes. Just some very brief housekeeping. Please keep yourself muted for now so that we can avoid background noise and everyone can hear the speakers clearly. If you'd like to ask questions, do feel free to put them in the chat function. Otherwise you can pop up at the end of the talk and ask your question yourself. Um, and uh, we recommend that you view this in a speaker view by clicking in the button on the top right hand corner of your screen so that you can just see the lovely speakers Tom and Claire who I'm going to now hand over to Tom and Claire. Hello hi um, I really hope that um, my wi-fi doesn't break down during the middle of this I have a feeling my son is on his pc upstairs and I'm um, using every single minute um, millimeter of bandwidth but um, if I if I uh, stop suddenly and my face freezes, Tom will doubtless take over. Um, welcome to what was uh, to be Lexa and Claire's insolvency potpourri. Unfortunately, Lexa's um, unable to make it and Tom has kindly stepped in. Uh, you might have seen from the bullet points that Lexa and I prepared some while ago now that we were going to cover three things, arbitration in insolvency, privilege and schemes. Now that was a pretty ambitious list for 20 minutes uh, and um, I have made the executive decision to jettison to two of those topics and I'm going to we're going to focus on arbitration and so the the talk should be uh, now entitled Tom and Claire's arbitration potpourri. Um, now the uh, Lexa um, has written a, a very detailed paper which I think is almost finished and we can circulate that after uh, the conference today. Please do get in touch with um, myself, uh, Lexa or Hayley uh, for a copy otherwise I think it'll be sent out to you. Now you probably um, in the BBI uh, know more than, uh, than we do in England the intersection between arbitration and insolvency company disputes continues to generate a lot of litigation and there's been a raft of new cases in 2020 in England. Uh, we've had at least three, uh, Bridgehouse and BAE which was uh, about the arbitrability of, uh, the, of directions to regularise the, regularize the register when the company has been restored. Uh, it, the court held that even though under the relevant legislation it said the court had the power to do to make those directions uh, it was a, a power which could be exercised by an arbitrator uh, the next case is Telnick and Nip uh, which is a disputed debt on a creditor's winding up petition uh, and the third is River Rock and Bank of St Petersburg which was a clawback claim by um, liquidators in uh, Russian uh, insolvency proceedings and there was a London arbitration agreement and the English court uh, up required uh, the Russian proceedings to be um, anti-suited so that the arbitration could continue. In the, England is not alone, there have been, uh, there's been a very important case in Singapore called Annan and VTB Bank uh, which deals with the approach on uh, to des describing the test the court should apply in uh, whether or not to stay or dismiss a creditor's winding up petition. 
and in Cayman, and this is um, why I'm very, very grateful to Tom for stepping in. He's just done a, a very important case in the Cayman Islands Court of Appeal called Family Mart, which involved an arbitration clause in the context of just and equitable winding up. Um, and we're going to come back to Family Mart because Tom's going to tell us all about it. But I, uh, in the course of my sort of researches for the purposes of today's talk, I, I note that there's been also been a very recent decision in the BBI in a case called Rangecroft, which you'll, you'll all be aware of. Um, and the interesting thing about that, um, and I'm, I'm, of course, telling you all things that you already know, that when a company applies to set aside a stat demand, um, the court will impose a mandatory stay under Section 18 of your Arbitration Act and refer the matter to arbitration. And this is a really interesting um, case, um, not least because it, it seems to uh, differ from the approach in Salford Estates. But I note that you, the, the Supreme Court's recently dealt with anti-suit injunctions um, to protect arbitrations in a case which is unpronounceable, but I've uh, abbreviated as AES and Kamenogorsk. And the Supreme Court there said that an anti-suit injunction, which of course is the mirror of the, of the statutory stay, can be made even when there's no arbitration um, to be uh, on for talk, no arbitration contemplated. Um, so I think perhaps we should start off by dealing, and this is, um, I think this is where I'll hand over to Tom, to deal with, with the, the two situations which are particularly interesting, um, unfair prejudice petitions against the background of an arbitration agreement between the shareholders and just an equitable winding up petitions where there's an arbitration agreement. And of course, there's the Jim, Jim Peng and Peak Hotels case in, in the BVI in 2015. So, um, Tom, shall I hand over to you to describe the current controversial questions? Yeah, um, sure. Um, we, you, you start off with Fulham Football Club, which tells you that um, an unfair prejudice petition in England, at least, was uh, considered to be arbitrable. Um, when the Court of Appeal in England dealt with it, and it was a court with, it was Patton who gave the judgment, but Ricks was a member of the panel. Um, the, 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 the solution they had was that unfair prejudice was arbitrable, but winding up was not. Um, winding up was uh, covered by a case called Repeveral Mines. And so they couldn't just say the same thing for winding up as they could for unfair prejudice. Um, so what the, the solution they came up with was that the uh, a winding up petition, um, of a, an arbitration clause that covered a winding up, would be treated as a an implied agreement not to present a petition. Um, so that's where matters stood with regard to winding up and unfair prejudice, and pretty much everyone followed Fulham Football Club. Um, we had then this hearing in Cayman. Um, last year in a case called Family Mart. And the Cayman legislation is slightly different to yours. Um, it has uh, two different provisions. It has one provision which requires a mandatory stay if, a, if someone has agreed not to present a winding up petition. There's no discretion and there's an express provision dealing with it. Um, the other thing that's different, as you may know, is that the um, there is no unfair prejudice remedy and instead the court has a range of remedies available on a just and equitable petition and they're all discretionary and they're all um, deeply fact sensitive. So the Court of Appeal um, was presented with an argument first of all, I mean the judge found against us, the Court of Appeal then uh, was presented with one argument that it was outside the scope of the arbitration clause what they wanted to do and um, Ricks made short work of that. He said that basically after Fiona Trust, that's an argument that doesn't get you very far. But he said uh, by, by the same token, um, our arguments about arbitrability are much more interesting. And they concluded that a winding up petition was not arbitrable because 
um, the court has to make a decision about the remedies, which is very fact sensitive. Um, secondly, because the section, rather like your section and the English section, is expressed to be based on the opinion of the court. It's not just a power that's exercised, but it has to be just and equitable in the, in the opinion of the court. Um, then he then then you take into account that the winding up petition being made is being made at the date of the trial, and the discretion has to be exercised by reference to the trial, which is a point that was confirmed recently in your Privy Council appeal called Chu and Lao. And um, the facts, therefore, that need to be taken into account are all those that have to be taken into account at trial. So you can't just uh, adjourn it, let an arbitrator find facts, and then come back to court. I mean, you might have some more disputed facts about whether or not they've corrected things and then go back to arbitration and have an endless cycle. Um, and so for those sorts of reasons, the Court of Appeal con considered what an arbitral. The other side have now applied for leave to appeal um, to the Privy Council. They refused leave by the Court of Appeal, but I suspect they'll get it from the, from the Privy Council and we'll see what the Privy Council say. But it might turn on the rather peculiar nature of the Cayman legislation. So that family mark, as far as I can explain it briefly, I've probably taken up too much of your 20 minutes. Not at all. Um, well, what I'm interested to understand now is really what the difference is between um, arbitrability in the context of a just and equitable winding up versus arbitrability in the context of unfair prejudice petitions. Because um, the unfair prejudice petition is uh, the Fulham, Fulham Football Club, says a lot of it's arbitrable. The reason, I think one of the reasons there's a difference is uh, an unfair prejudice petition is typically, um, um, it has got to be dealt with on historic facts. So it's, it makes sense that an arbitrator can find the facts of an unfair prejudice petition and then remit the matter to the court when the court has to exercise the discretion to give all the remedies maybe with some directions as to that. I mean, that does cause problems. I, I've got a couple of arbitrations on unfair prejudice petitions at the moment in Hong Kong. And um, the, 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 it, it's very difficult for the arbitrators to find facts, which you know they, they would like to give remedies, but they can't. And then it has to go back to the court and the court then needs to know a lot more about the facts than just unfair prejudice. But but basically, the difference is that it's it, you can see why a court might want to ha might be able to defer to an arbitrator on historic facts. That's not the case with a just and equitable winding up. And that was actually something that, not in relation to arbitration, but that was something that was debated in Chu and Lao because I listened to the argument. Well, it is. It does. It does strike me as slightly peculiar that it, a very similar jurisdiction, albeit with you know, at the end of the day, the court has a wider um, sort of set of powers in, a, in the context of unfair prejudice than it does with just, just an equitable winding up. But I, I, I have to say, I find it legally incoherent that the court should hive off for arbitration and in effect subcontract its fact-finding exercise to a, a tribunal when in any kind of um, normal unfair prejudice um, proceedings, it wouldn't just be the, the facts as at a particular date, it wouldn't just be historic facts. It's usually um, disputes which continue up until the moment of trial. Mm. So what happens yeah. in that interregnum between the arbitrator's award and then remitting it back to court? Well, and it's very relevant to the remedy at, at the end of the day in, in an unfair prejudice petition, what's happened at the date of the trial. Hmm. So it's, it's it, it, you're right. There is a different. I mean, it is difficult to see the difference. One of the one of the other differences is that the winding up um, jurisdiction is uh, you know has since the 19th century been expressed to be based on uh, when it is in the opinion of the court just and equitable to wind up petition. And there is that there's 19th century authority re Peveril gold mines that you cannot contract out of a winding up petition. I mean, you can't say, you can't agree not to wind up. You can agree not to present a petition. But that's as far as it goes. So the court's <laughs> exercising its, its discretion, its jurisdiction, um, but the opinion um, which it's 
forming is actually based on the opinion of an arbitrator. No, it can't. That's the winding up. It can't. I mean, our argument is it. The, the statute makes it difficult for anybody else to form that opinion. Whereas it's very common in arbitration that an arbitrator will exercise the powers that a statute confers on the court. That's not the issue. The issue is that the statute expressly requires the opinion to be formed by a court and the court then to exercise discretion about remedies. Hmm. So apart from sort of just an equitable and unfair prejudice petitions, um, what other issues in insolvency company law are you finding, especially in Cayman, which are intersecting with arbitration? Well, I mean, you, 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 you can get it in all sorts of areas. A liquidator can come across um, uh, situations where the, the company's entered into an arbitration agreement and he wants to litigate perhaps with, you know, that'll involve a clawback claim or something. Um, but there are all sorts of contexts in which you can, um, you, you can arbitrate. And, uh, you know, things that are disputes which, which are relevant to schemes of arrangement. Um, I've got a case at the moment where we have a derivative claim and the company has entered into uh, some sort of agreement with another party and the, the, the other party is making similar allegations to the ones that we're making the derivative claim and they're applying to stay it on arbitration grounds. I mean, that's, you know, there, there, are, there are more and more situations like this because people put them in the articles and then came and they're encouraged to do that because there's an express statutory provision. Um, so I think that's why, you know, you are coming, you, you are going to see more, in, in company cases, you're going to see more and more um, issues about arbitration and arbitrability. Mm. Well, I think we've kind of, we've done very well. We've, we've covered a lot of um, material and we've, I think we've reached our 20 minutes. So I think we can open it up to questions. There for you, Claire. Uh -huh. Liz, you're on mute. Thanks, Claire. I was going to ask, do you think that your family mark decision, Tom, shows that the court is going to start moving away from, um, is it Fulham Football Club and, and that kind of um, reasoning? Because I think, as Claire said, it just seems incoherent. Do you think long term that's where the, where the, where the um, decision is going to go? Well, I mean, uh, Ricks was the uh, Ricks was one of the panel in Family Mart as, as he was in Fulham Football Club, and the the argument proceeded on the basis that Fulham Football Club was essentially right, except on the point of implying an agreement not to present a petition. Um, in other words, he was right about unfair prejudice, and he was right about the fact that a winding up petition is not arbitrable. Um, so I think people people misread Fulham Football Club as dealing with unfair prejudice, but there's a there's an obiter passage about winding up petitions, mm. and um, what he really is saying is they're not arbitrable. So I'm going to deal with them as an agreement not to present a petition, which is um, something you can't do here because there's an express statutory provision. But uh, it may well still fly in other jurisdictions. You know, we, there are differences in Cayman that don't apply in other jurisdictions that make it difficult to say it's arbitrable here. And just another broad question. I know you and Claire have focused your discussion on arbitration and insolvency issues. Um, but what do you think the kind of current global climate and the, the, the likelihood that there's going to be a real increase in insolvency um, cases across the world? What developments do you think that might bring out in the BVI and Cayman um, and in other jurisdictions? I don't know. I mean, when, when we had the financial crisis, the first thing that happens is that people run out of money and you, you need money to run a, a, a liquidation. So it doesn't mean that there's going to be a lot more litigation. The first reaction might be that you actually see less litigation. And that did happen after 2008, and it just took a bit longer for all these disputes to come out, usually because they're Madoffs, you know, they're frauds, they're redemption disputes, and those, those sorts of things. But um, I, I, I haven't seen any evidence of an increase in that in the offshore jurisdiction just yet. 
Yeah, and I wouldn't expect it to sort of be filtering through now. It does take a while to come through. Um, Tom and I remember sort of pre financial crisis, earlier um, financial crises, and it does, it takes time to feed into the system. Um, and the, all the redemption and clawback issues seem to be, you know, they're still bubbling away and they're, they're still being litigated. Um, I think the, the COVID questions are, are going to arise just as much in ordinary commercial litigation as they do in, in insolvency and probably before insolvency. Hmm. Okay, well, if anyone else has got any other questions, feel free to either type them in the chat bar or turn your video on and, and ask a question. We'll give everyone a few seconds and otherwise um, we'll go on to the panel discussion. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom and Claire. Uh, we're going to ask Andrew, Bobby and Tara to turn their video on now. Um, and we're going to have a discussion about abusive process in cross border cases. Good afternoon to everyone in the BVI and also to those of you in UK. I think we have a few people joining from other parts of the world, too. So welcome. My name is Andrew Mould and co-presenting this panel session with me is Bobby Friedman and Tara Taylor, who are both exceptional juniors at Wilberforce. Bobby and Tara each have a practice focusing on fraud, general commercial insolvency and company disputes. As Liz has mentioned, um, this session will focus on abusive process and a few related concepts. Abusive process is an interesting topic because it arises fairly often in practice and in international disputes, it's often linked with other behaviour such as forum shopping. It's also one of those areas in which the authorities on the one hand emphasise that it involves a broad merits-based judgment and is therefore very fact specific. But at the same time, there's quite a lot of guidance amounting in a sense to general rules about how the court should approach the exercise. And that is something we'll come on to look at very shortly. I would encourage members of the audience to participate as we go along. As Liz has said, there is a chat function, so please feel free to send in any questions or comments and we'll try and pick them up. The brief plan of action is that Bobby is going to kick off by considering abuse of process generally and a typical situation in which the issue of abuse might arise. I'll then briefly look at the topic of privity and Tara will then consider parallel proceedings in different jurisdictions. So without further ado, over to you, Bobby. Thanks very much, Andrew. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, sorry not to be with you uh, this year. Hope we will be uh, back in the much sunnier climate of the BVI uh, next year, rather than looking out onto a very dark and cold London. So um, as Andrew mentioned, I'm going to be uh, looking at a, at a worked example and unfortunately it's quite a, a complicated worked example but I will uh, try to simplify it as much as possible. It relates to uh, to the case law both that we have here in England and it's case law that has been uh, specifically applied in the BVI as well. Uh, what, I, what I'm looking at is that uh, as Andrew mentioned it is a broad and merits-based approach when it, it comes to abuse of process. The question essentially is, well, should you have brought your claim uh, before? Should you have brought it in the earlier proceedings? So through this, uh, as I say, a little bit uh, complicated example, hopefully this will raise some of the points that might come up and, and help you, you to help us to work through some of the, the pitfalls uh, that there might be. Now, so let's uh, uh, go on to the example. So imagine there is a claim and you have uh, the claimant, a company sues a defendant and that defendant brings in an additional defendant. So let's let's imagine, for example, uh, that um, you are um, the, the company buys some gym equipment um, that it's going to su supply some people and the gym equipment is faulty. Um, but the company that they have bought it from uh, blames the original manufacturer. So you have the additional defendant there. And then unsurprisingly, in circumstances like this where something has gone wrong, you have another claim. So we've got claim two. And you have a different claimant, but that different claimant sues the same defendant and the same defendant brings in the same uh, additional defendant. So different claimants, but same defendant and additional defendant. So simple uh, so far. 
But let, let's imagine that you get a bit of a divergence between the proceedings. So let's let's say that the additional defendant says that they have an exclusion clause in claim one uh, that applies in claim two. There is no such exclusion clause. So they say uh, that uh, the basis of liability is a bit different. So what you end up with uh, as a result of this scenario is that you've got the two claims. They get case managed together. But let's imagine that in claim one, uh, uh, the only issue is quantum, but but quantum is only going to be decided between the primary b between the claimant and the primary defendant. That's different to claim two, where everything, all issues of liability and quantum, are going to be determined as between all of the parties to it. So you're proceeding towards having uh, two separate hearings. One, which is uh, in claim one, only between the pro between the claimant and the primary defendant, and in claim two, between everyone on everything. Um, and then what essentially happens is that um, there's a settlement in, in claim one. Uh, you agree um, the, the quantum, so let's say the quantum is two million, that's agreed. Um, and then you decide uh, to go, the, the company, go, the defendant goes into administration, you decide to go after the insurer. And effectively in claim one, there's a considered litigation strategy, which is you, you go after the defendant, they go, go into liquidation, um, or administration, and then and then you go after the insurer. Claim two, everything on the other hand is up for grabs. It's all being uh, it, it, it's going towards a very large trial, lots of legal fees. Uh, good news for all of us. Um, and then uh, you ha you have this uh, long trial, and then it's only after that, after all that has happened, after you've had this long trial, um, that suddenly um, there's a problem with recovery in claim one, and so the so the original additional defendant who remember is an additional defendant in claim two as well um you the, the claimant decides to go after them having having ignored that additional defendant so far and the question is is it an abuse of process to then finally go after this uh, additional defendant now why you may be asking have i come up with this horribly complicated set of facts and i've tried to simplify them as much as i can believe me the reason is because there is uh, as i say this english court of appeal case uh, the audi stores case um which was uh, which was applied in the bvi uh, in the serena and equity uh, trustee limited case a, a few years ago uh, which sets out some of the circumstances in which there might be an abuse of process now one of the key things to consider um in this case is is that actually you you have different um you have different parties effectively um so although in claim one there was never any decided issue as between the claimant and the additional defendant um is it nonetheless uh, an abuse of process uh, to go after that a, a additional defendant? So in other words, can it be an abuse of process to go after a third party in other proceedings? Now, of course, the, the usual circumstance is when, you've, is when you have sued a defendant and then you decide to sue them again. And, and so the key thing to bear in mind is that you, it's much more likely to be an abuse of process if you have the same defendant. If you sue the same person twice, you can obviously see why when it comes to the, the overall justice of it and uh, and really whatever the uh, whatever the vagaries of the test ultimately this is one which is in all the circumstances based on justice obviously when you just have uh, the same person being sued twice it's obviously a lot more vexatious what about where you do have someone who, who you didn't in fact sue in the first place well um what the authorities say is that it, it's likely to be a rare case where that third party can can say that that it's oppressive to bring uh, an action because obviously they weren't vexed by that original set of litigation but what we have uh, in my uh, rather complicated example for following the, the Audi stores case are some of the circumstances where you can run into problems even when you're suing third parties now a couple of, of things that would make the difference because in, in my scenario I think it's probably on the borderline, depending on what you what you would do. And one of the things that, that I think makes a, a real difference um, is about telling not just your opponent, but also the court um, what you intend to do. And what, what they found in Audi, and what is a really important thing to bear in mind is that if you have a considered litigation strategy, and you are working through that litig litigation strategy and you flag it up to everyone else, it's much less likely to, to be oppressive. So go back to my example, I, I mentioned that there was a very long six week trial where all of the other, in claim two, everything was being decided. So it would be, be important ahead of that 
uh, to flag the fact that you have a litigation strategy, which means you're not going after a particular party for now. That's why you're not participating in those proceedings, but that in due course, you would want to go after them. And it's not enough, and this is what the authorities say, it's not enough, or it may not be enough, to just tell your opponent, you also need to tell the court, because then the court can decide how to allocate its resources based on what it knows uh, may be coming later. So telling the court and telling the other side uh, is a really important point. The second point, as I already um, mentioned, is about having a considered litigation strategy. So in the Audi case um, itself, um, there was a plan to sue the insurer when, when there was this, this issue where the, the defendant went uh, into administration. And even though, as it turned out, that proved to be a rather bad idea as a matter of litigation strategy, it was a considered litigation strategy and it was done on purpose. So compare that to a scenario, for example, which of course would never happen, where there is a, a lawyer that is negligent. And so by mistake, effectively, you don't get involved uh, in some proceedings that are ongoing, don't get involved in a claim that, that, that's ongoing. And um, that would be rather different compared to, to the scenario um, where, you, um, where, where, you make it, uh, where you make it considered uh, and you, you make it clear to everybody um, that, that that's what you're doing. And, and I think there's another interesting aspect of that, uh, which is that what about if it's if it's what might one consider a, a reason that there's not that much of a good reason? It's considered, but it's it's not necessarily um, a good reason. So what about if you don't have very much money? Well, it seems that on the authorities, what counts is having that considered strategy. So if, for example, um, it wasn't that you were going to sue the insurer and then that went south. Uh, it wasn't, on the other hand, that the lawyers got it wrong, but but simply you didn't have enough money. Well, the court, in my view, would look at that as part of a considered strategy. And it would it, it would go to this question of, is it unjust? Is it vexatious to bring this claim again? Ought you to have done it earlier? And if ultimately you, you couldn't because of impecuniosity, then that probably is a, a, a factor that will be taken into account. So, so I hope that that, that brief but, but somewhat complicated example gives you a sense of how, how this will be fact specific, but that ultimately it, it, it's, it all comes, comes down to effectively a sniff test, because what you will get later on is a court looking at this and saying, well, you know, coulda, woulda, shoulda, could you have done this, should you have done this? Um, and so um, where you have told everybody what's going on, well, it's, it's hard to blame you because obviously your opposing parties could make an application to join you so that you're bound to whatever hearing is, is going to take place. Um, if it was part of a considered strategy, it, it's less vexatious. It's not that you're having another go. So to, to bear in mind that obviously it's when you do have a third party, um, it's going to be much less likely that it's an abuse of process, but, but ultimately it still can be. So you have to bear that in mind. So when you are faced with these complicated, different sets of proceedings, you have to bear in mind, not just your defendant who you're going against, but also anyone else who, you, who potentially you could bring in and should have brought in into those proceedings. Bobby, thanks. Um, I'm just having a look to see, are there any uh, questions or comments? Uh, none that I can, I can see. Um, okay, thank you, Bobby. I now want to consider um, an interesting issue that crops up both when dealing with causal action and issue estoppel and also wider forms of abuse. And that is the issue of privity. You'll all no doubt recall that judgments in personam bind only parties and their privies. And therefore, it's important to know who is the privy of someone else. Of course, where the parties to one set of proceedings and then a second set of proceedings are the same, the matter is straightforward. However, where the second set of proceedings involve not the same party, but a related party in some sense, that's where things become interesting. In the well-known House of Lords decision of Carl Zeiss and Rainer Keeler, Lord Reed referred to there being three types of privity. First of all, privity of blood, such as heirs. Second, privity of title, uh, someone who succeeds to the rights or liabilities of another, for example, on death or on insolvency. 
and third, privity of interest. And the one that has generated most discussion in the cases is privity of interest. And that's probably because it's quite an open-ended and fact-sensitive issue. And that can be seen um, from some of the main tests set down in the authorities. Perhaps the best known test comes from a case called Gleason and Whipple, in which Sir Robert McGarry talked about whether there is a sufficient degree of identification between the parties so that it is, it is just to hold the second party bound. And in another well-known case, Resolution Chemicals and Lundbeck, Lord Justice Floyd asked whether the second party was in reality the party to the original proceedings. Now, it has been said that these types of tests by reference to what is just or who is the real party are rather circular. However, they probably just serve to emphasize that it's really a very fact sensitive exercise. Now, one common relationship that is sometimes relied upon to found an argument of privity is that of parent and subsidiary company. So does that form of relationship amount to privity of interest? Well, the authorities are pretty clear in my view that the relationship of parent and subsidiary is not on its own sufficient to amount to a relationship of privity. On its own, such a relationship merely means that one company has a commercial interest in the other and a commercial interest is not enough to amount to privity. Further, to hold that there was privity on this ground alone would drive a coach and horses through the doctrine of separate corporate personality. I should say there's, there's a fairly good discussion of this subject in a recent 2020 um, decision of Mr. Justice Bryan in the English Queen's Bench Division in a case called MAD Atelier and Manez. Uh, for those of you interested in fine dining, the facts are of some interest. The case involved a dispute over the ownership of restaurants trading under the name of the top chef, Joel Robuchon, who died in 2018. As the bon viveurs amongst you may know, Monsieur Robuchon held the record for the highest number of Michelin stars, a whopping 32. So if there's one thing you've learned today, um, it might be that. We'll give the case reference and the uh, relevant extracts in the written paper, which I think is going to be circulated in the coming days. So anyway, getting back on topic, what more do you need than just the parent subsidiary relationship to satisfy the test of privity? Well, in Deutsche Bank and Sebastian Holdings, Mr. Justice Cook considered the issue of privity of interest when determining whether to make a non-party cost order. In that case, the cost order was sought against a Mr. Vic, who was the sole shareholder and sole director of the name defendant, SHI. Mr. Vic was also found to have controlled the litigation on SHI's behalf and was its principal witness and the main player in the relevant events. And in those circumstances, Mr. Justice Cook concluded that Mr. Vic was a privy of SHI and that he was bound by the findings in the court's prior judgment by reason of issue estoppel. So control of the conduct of the litigation uh, may be important in providing that extra factor to give rise to the relationship of privity of interest. In um, the MAD Atelier Manners, the Mission and Star case, Mr. Justice Bryan considered that privity was only likely to be established between a parent and subsidiary, where the party to the second set of proceedings could have been joined to the original proceedings. So that will also be an important consideration. It is worth noting that even if a relationship of privity isn't established, and therefore a formal issue of stopper won't arise, the facts could still fall within the wider concept of abusive process that Bobby talked about. And that's because abusive process may arise in situations which go beyond those involved in the same parties or their privies. But that said, and to really repeat a point that Bobby's made, the courts have made it clear that it will be rare for relitigation to amount to an abuse where it involves an action brought by a third party rather than by a party to the original proceedings or their privy. And therefore, whilst this line of argument is open, it will only be in exceptional cases that it will succeed. So that's enough about privies. Now over to Tara to consider abuse and foreign proceedings. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so obviously when you have proceedings in different jurisdictions, that's often a fertile ground for arguments of abusive process. 
Um, Bobby was discussing uh, a contract that was litigated in England, uh, and we assume, or let's assume, that it had an English governing law clause. Now, if we imagine that the first company, Company A, had also entered into a second contract with Company B um, at the same time as the English contract, and in the English proceedings relating to the English contract, the court, for whatever reason, had found as a matter of fact that the goods under the second contract were not fit for purpose. So on the back of that finding of fact, Company A trots off to the BVI to bring proceedings against Company uh, B under the second contract, and that's because the contract has a non-exclusive BVI jurisdiction clause and a BVI governing law clause. So if we assume for a moment that the BVI proceedings were properly brought, um, the question is, would it be an abusive process for the company to argue in the BVI proceedings that the goods were fit for purpose, despite the fact that the English court had found to the contrary? Um, and so we're in the realm of issue estoppel again here. Um, and the question here is, can a foreign judgment, is it capable of giving rise to issue estoppel? Uh, and the answer is yes, uh, as long as certain conditions are satisfied. Um, and those are that the court, the decision has to have been by a court of competent jurisdiction. Uh, the judgment has to be final and conclusive. Obviously, both the parties uh, have to be the same in each proceedings, or, or as Andrew's discussed, uh, it has to be between their privies. And there has to have been a clear determination of the issue by the court, which means that it can't have been an over to comment. It has to have formed part of the um, the ratio of the decision and, and those considerations definitely apply uh, in the BVI. Um, one of the relevant cases is VTV um, and Micros. Um, so the thing that sticks out here is really what does a judgment being final and conclusive mean in, in this situation? Uh, and what it essentially means is that the issue can't be relitigated between the parties in the foreign jurisdiction. Um, and what that actually means when one drills down is that the foreign legal system has to recognize the doctrine of issue estoppel. Um, and so on the situation here, would issue a stop will be in vote so that company B was um, uh, was not able to claim that the goods were fit, of, uh, fit for purpose, would that constitute uh, an abuse? Um, and I think it probably would, because both the parties in this case uh, are the same. Uh, England obviously recognises the doctrine of issue estoppel. Um, and so then the question is, well, was the judge's finding a fact uh, overture or not? And obviously we can't tell um, on the facts before us, but, but assuming that it wasn't and that it formed um, part of the ratio, then issue of stock was going to arise and, um, and company B is not going to be able to, to rely on that defence. Um, so then if we look at the same scenario from another angle, would it have been, is it an abusive process for company A to have brought the BVI proceedings in the first place, given that the first contract had already been litigated um, in England? And, and this is where we, uh, it raises questions um, relating to what Bobby discussed earlier. But the first, the first relevant thing to consider is, is the jurisdiction clause. And of course, in this case, um, it's a non-exclusive uh, BVI jurisdiction clause. Um, and of course, in those circumstances, what happens is where a party picks a permitted jurisdiction, then for all intents and purposes, that becomes the exclusive jurisdiction clause. Um, so here, the question really is, is the fact that the English contract was litigated, um, the fact that the English contract proceedings were brought in England, did that constitute a submission to the English court for the purposes of the second BVI contract? Um, and this is where we uh, apply the principles that Bobby was, was discussing. Um, it, they're the Henderson and Henderson principles. Um, so the question is, is the BVI contract one, uh, is the claim arising under the BVI contract one that could and should have been brought as part of the um, English contract proceedings? And if the answer is yes, then it's going to be struck out um, for, or is likely to be struck out for abuse. Um, so in determining that question, the court is going to conduct the broad merits uh, based approach. Um, things that are going to be relevant are whether the defendants are the same. If they are, then abusive process is much more likely to be found. Uh, the court will also take into account um, the Aldi requirement, which is what Bobby referred to, which is making sure that you have informed the court in the earlier proceedings. So in this case, the English proceedings that you are contemplating bringing um, a second set of proceedings in relation to the second contract. Have you informed the other side at an earlier stage that you were 
uh, potentially going to bring this second claim. If you have, um, the court is likely to look much more kindly upon you for having brought these second proceedings in the foreign jurisdiction. Um, again, if, if the claims um, are based on the same core factual and witness evidence, um, that's likely to give rise to, to abuse, uh, all the more so if, um, if issue estoppel is found, um, and the courts have said that that is a very powerful factor uh, in favour of finding uh, abuse. So assuming that taking all of that into account, which I think it would in this case, the court would lean towards finding um, an abusive process and lean towards striking out uh, the BVI proceedings, what would the effect be of the fact that there's a BVI governing law clause? Um, and assume that, as I said, contract, uh, the first contract had an English law clause. Um, well, I think the answer is it definitely wouldn't preclude a finding of abuse. It's going to be one of the many factors that fall within this cauldron of, of broad um, based merits, a broad merits based approach. Um, and that's because prima facie the English courts are perfectly well placed to deal uh, with questions of foreign law. So arguably you could have had a single set of proceedings dealing with two contracts, each of which were governed by, by a separate law. Uh, that said, Depending on the overall circumstances of the case, the court may well take the view that it would not have been proportionate or for some other reason desirable to have these two contracts litigated under different laws um, in a single set of, of proceedings, um, in which case you know, the BVI proceedings um, won't be struck out. And of course, if the BVI court is feeling um, particularly uh, proprietorial, it may rely on that argument uh, and similar arguments to try and keep the proceedings um, in the BVI. Um, and of course, if, if that happens, you still have to deal with questions uh, of issue estoppel and there may be other actions um, or concessions that have been made in the other proceedings that are going to tie your hands in these uh, second proceedings in any event. So one always has to tread carefully when one's considering uh, pursuing related, uh, related proceedings in two different uh, jurisdictions. Um, so I think that that's really all I would say canter through the, the uh, in, questions of abuse where you've got uh, different jurisdictions at play and um, I don't know if there are any questions on the chat sadly not about any oh, Tara I had um mm -hmm. I had one comment and, and one question um you mentioned that one of the conditions for an abuse arising out of a foreign judgment was that the um under the foreign law um in which uh, the uh, judgment was given the first time round, they must recognize the concept of an issue estoppel. Mm -hmm. And am I right in thinking in the, uh, the, the Mad Atelier case, the one that I'm obsessed, obsessed with dealing with uh, Michelin sure, stars, yeah. that um, it was held that as a matter of French law, and it was dealing with a French judgment, there was no recognition of the concept of issue estoppel. And therefore the issue was not binding um, under French law and therefore it couldn't give rise to an issue of estoppel under English law. Yeah that's absolutely right um, and I suppose it's I don't know it, maybe it can come and surprise you sometimes because you sort of assume well issue of estoppel it's such a such a standard thing everyone must recognize it but um, yeah that's right so France didn't recognize it and so so there was no no estoppel and presumably I haven't seen this in the judgments but in cases but presumably questions or arguments can also arise as to whether a finding falls within the ratio or was it obiter uh, and presumably that that's a sort of possible um, basis on which you could seek, you know, to to undermine a find or to find a, a, a an issue estoppel. So, um, um, yeah. and 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 the question I had was, I think you you referred to a non-exclusive jurisdiction clause. Yeah. Um, had you been dealing with an exclusive jurisdiction clause, would do you think that would have made all the difference? So I'm straying into dangerous territory here because everyone's going to know much better than me. But no, I would have thought that would have made all the difference. Uh, yeah, because where you have an exclusive jurisdiction clause, then I would have thought prima facie that it, that is exactly what it is. I don't know whether you disagree. No, I don't. I, I mean, if you have an exclusive jurisdiction clause which requires uh, litigation in a different country, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how it can be abused um, to, to comply with that jurisdiction clause. Um, great. Well, I've got a question for Bobby, um, and it's really about the scope of the Aldi stores requirement, because, I mean, how open do you need to be with the court and with other parties about your litigation strategy? Because, you know, there, there may be very good reasons why you want to 
uh, for example, start proceedings against one party but not another, or in one jurisdiction but not another. Um, and I mean, do you really need to put all your cards on the table? How how far do you need to go? Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point, Liz, because obviously you don't want to use this as a as a uh, as a stick to beat yourself with, in that you you end up giving away what what you want to do. And I I think it's about choosing your your moment. So. Um, you can write a, a short letter to the court and to the other side or, or the other tactic often is that if you've got a procedural hearing before the court, you uh, drop it into your skeleton argument in fairly brief terms, just co confirming that you know, even by footwork, footnote that, uh, of course, in due course, um, it may be necessary to bring proceedings against whoever it is. Um, I, don't, I don't think you want to go into too much detail, uh, obviously, depending on the case. But what it what it's doing is 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 just you you do need to flag the issue that in in the unlikely eventuality that you don't succeed in X claim that down the road uh, it 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 may well prove necessary to bring proceedings against someone else. So as I say, uh, I think the the two the two clearest ways of doing it are in that short letter copied to to the court. Or, or else in, in some kind of court document, most obviously the skeleton argument. But no, I don't, there's no there's no need. I mean, it may be if, if you've got a challenge down the road, obviously, then you might have to go back and show you're working. But, yeah. but there's no need at that preliminary stage to, to explain everything that you're going to do. Mm. It's to flag that that, may, that that is a possibility down the track. And, and obviously, what you want to do then it would mean that if, if any point is taken down the down the line you're able just to go back to that document and say well look we let you know and you didn't make an application to join us you didn't write back and say that that was outrageous uh, and so on so I think that's probably the sort of the depending on the facts obviously that's the happy medium that you can you can get to yeah so it's probably best to be as kind of broad and as non-specific as you can be while still kind of putting everyone on notice um, because you don't want to make a rod for your own back and in particular about the reason you don't want you don't want to be too open about the reasons that you're pursuing a certain strategy uh, because those reasons may change and if you're in um, if you're in a situation where you're in a second set of proceedings and you're facing an argument about abusive process you you don't want to be giving one reason in those set of proceedings that you haven't given in the first set Yes, I mean, I, I agree with that subject to one caveat, which is obviously the, the potential downside of, of getting your second claim struck out as an abuse is, is obviously very substantial. And it's only natural as a party, you particularly if, if uh, as we all know, when you're in very hard fought litigation, you sometimes want to give away almost nothing. And you do have to imagine that this document is before the court in a in a challenge down down the line, and if it's a it, it, if you if you do put it in in two general terms, uh, if you just say and of co of course there may be further pr proceedings generally something like that, is that really specific enough to have allowed the, that other the other side to have taken an informed decision as to whether you should be forced to uh, join someone else into the proceedings, for example? So, what I would say is yes. As a litigator, of course, you don't want to give away too much and you don't want to show all of your working. But but equally, don't fall into that trap, particularly in that hard fought litigation, of of not of not giving giving enough. It has to be you, there has to be some substance in there, so that imagining yourself defending that that test down the road, you made it obvious. It, as I say, it may may only be a, a very short paragraph in the skeleton argument, just um, ju just raising it. But, but ultimately that that is a necessary price um, mm. because, because the the downside is so substantial yeah okay um, I don't think there are any other questions so thank you very much Andrew Tara and Bobby we're now um, we're going to start our virtual networking.